I have the pleasure of introducing Ken Dill. He is a former BPS president and a speaker at the annual meeting. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. How should we understand how the basic science of biophysics pays off for the public? So first of all, biophysics is a very broad area, very diverse tools, um, broad interests among the scientists who work in that area. It pays off for, in many different ways. Uh, one is health and disease, how we discover new drugs. Another is clean water supplies, better food supplies, uh, better ways of converting solar energy. It pays off in many, many ways. But I want to take just a minute to say something about how it also pays off for the economy. And in particular, what I want to say a word about is how does any basic science and any advanced technology pay off for the economy? Uh, and the point I want to make is that these are long-term investments and we don't know the answer when we start. And let me take an example of the iPhone. How did the iPhone develop? One key question people often ask is, what's the relative role of basic science versus industrial science? iPhone is the perfect epitome of an industrial development. The iPhone 5 came from the iPhone 4. But if you look at it in the bigger perspective, what you see is basic science was essential at every level. And let me make that case for a second. The iPhone 5, or any iPhone, comes from four or five scientific threads. Co basic computers, uh, solid state electronics, GPS, wireless technology, and the internet. And if you trace all of those back to the roots, they were all academic basic science discoveries. Computers go back to the University of Pennsylvania in 1947. Solid state electronics goes back to Bell Labs in 1947, a basic study of just how materials uh, act in general. Um, the GPS, uh, uh, the, uh, GPS was, was a very interesting story because that was all about testing theories of general relativity and building better atomic clocks. And that led to our ability now to locate where you are to within a few feet. Those, so summarizing, I would say all of the technology that's in the iPhone, yes, industrial technology is very important for it, but without basic science, we never ever would have gotten here. And just to summarize, I would say, first of all, it took 60 years. It's about a lifetime to get from basic science to the payoff. And secondly, I would say the payoffs are huge. $100 billion a year industry, for example, that we're talking about. Lots of jobs, but it takes that time to, to be able to do that. And Ken, what are the ways that physics and mathematics have contributed to biology? So that's a perfect question because, in a way, it's also very much about how does basic science contribute to applied science. And physics and mathematics have been very critical to how we do biology these days. Um, here's some examples. Watson and Crick in 1953 uh, discovered the structure of DNA. If it hadn't been for the fact that Crick was a physicist who could understand X-ray diffraction patterns, we wouldn't have the structure. Um, Lurie and Delbrook in the 1940s did the mathematics of how bacteria duplicate. And if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't have the fields of molecular biology and microbiology today. We have many tools that come from physics, X-ray crystallography, NMR, uh, atomic force microscopes, many, many tools. These are the basis for what's called structural biology. It's how we understand cells. It's how we understand proteins. It's how we discover drugs these days. Without those tools, we couldn't do any of that stuff. And one really critical thing, the last point I want to make here, one really critical thing is physicists bring one more thing, and that is they have ways of doing conceptualization called models. Some use computers, some don't use computers. But their way of understanding very small things like molecules and atoms on very fast time scales are exactly what we need to understand to be able to do things like drug discovery and understand biology. Now you've worked on a basic problem of science and that is the protein folding problem. What has been the payoff for that field of research? So the protein folding problem was kind of the epitome of very basic science. It started about 50 years ago. This is a problem of understanding how proteins get the shapes they have. They have many different shapes, and those shapes determine how they work and what kind of machinery they, uh, they what machine functions they perform in your body. Um, it, was a, it was a problem of basic science, but there have been many collateral successes along the way that paid off for the economy. One of them is the IBM Blue Gene computer. It's called Blue Gene because it was actually designed to deal with, to help with the protein folding problem. 
Um, so now we have a huge technology out there, the IBM Blue Gene computer. We have also distributed grid computing. A lot of that was developed because of the protein folding problem. We have new materials that are based on molecules that can fold up like proteins can. And probably the most interesting and critical one has to do with a class of diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, type 2 diabetes, that back when we started working on the protein folding problem, we didn't know they had any relationship to these diseases. And then in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s, we discovered those diseases are all protein folding diseases. So now, at that time, we then had a whole toolkit and a bunch of technologies and a bunch of people who all knew how to start uh, accelerating progress on those diseases because of it. And Ken, a lot of folks within the society talk about this, and it's a big issue, is, is lack of funding. So when it comes to research for scientists, has federal funding been adequate for the basic science and, and innovation that we need here in the United States? So I would say no. And uh, here's the, here are the numbers that I would use to make that case. First of all, if you look at the most critical number, I think, which is how much money does our federal government, the U.S. federal government, invest in research and development divided by the gross domestic pro product, which is an indication of the uh, importance and the investment that this government in, uh, puts into basic science. It was 1.7% of GDP in the 1960s. It's a third of that now. It's 0.7%. It has dropped monotonically all from, it has dropped for many years consistently. And so unfortunately what's happened is we are not investing and we have not been investing for 30 to 50 years anywhere near as much as we used to invest in basic science and technology. And let me just make one last point and that is, let me also compare how much our federal government invests in basic science versus how much our companies invest in more, more the development side, you might say, of technology development. And that too is a number that has dropped dramatically over the last 50, uh, 60 years. It used to be that our federal government would put in $2 into research and development for every $1 that, that companies across the country would put in. Now it turns out we put in only 50 cents per dollar instead of $2 per dollar. And the problem with that is that we, the, these developments take a human lifetime. The ones I mentioned for the iPhone took since 1947. Our parents and our grandparents basically paid for us to be able to have iPhones and iPads and the high technology we currently have. We are not paying for our kids and our grandchildren. We are not investing in the front end of basic science anywhere near enough to be creating the $100 billion a year industries for 30 years from now and 60 years from now. And such important issues to talk about. Thank you so much for shedding some light on these issues. Thank you.